Hello and welcome. I'm Ross King. This is Renaissance Discoveries. And in this episode, we are in Venice. I want to take us back, as always, more than 500 years in this episode to the day in about 1490 when a 40 year old schoolmaster arrives in Venice. He's the native of a small town in southern Italy, and for the past two decades, he's been mixing in learned circles and teaching Greek and Latin to young aristocrats. But by 1490, he has a dream. He wants to become a publisher. He wants to print books, books that people will actually read, that they'll read for pleasure, and that will be available to everyone. He wants to spread the wisdom of ancient authors such as Plato and Aristotle, and therefore make the world a better place. He's come to Venice because Venice is the capital of printing and publishing. One in eight books, more than 12% of all books published in Europe between the 1450s and 1490s was published here. So it was a good time and good place to turn up. And this middle-aged school teacher, a man calling himself Aldus Manutius, turns out to be exactly the right man. He would become one of the most important printers and publishers in history, one of the most important guys in the history of information technology, the man who would print the complete works of both Plato and Aristotle and many others in Greek, the man who dedicated his life to what he called the advantage of humanity, who gave the world, among other things, the comma and the semicolon. And he was the man who was crucial to the period of technological innovation and intellectual inquiry that we call the Renaissance. So who was Aldous? His intellectual formation, as well as political events and developments in technology, are key to understanding his ambitions. He was born in a tiny place called Bassiano, a village about 50 miles south of Rome. He was probably born about 1450. No one knows for certain, although his son said that he was born in 1452. I'd like to think he was right because that's the same year as Leonardo da Vinci, making it a good year for Renaissance geniuses and technological innovators. His first name was Teobaldo, which was shortened to Aldo, but we're not sure what his actual surname was, possibly Mandutio or Manucci, but Aldo had a relaxed attitude towards how he spelled it, and he would eventually Latinize himself like many intellectuals of the day and invent himself as Aldus Manutius. In 1467, when he was about 15 or 16, he went to Rome to study at La Sapienza, a university founded in 1303. And he was very lucky with who his professor was, a guy from Verona in the north of Italy called Gaspare da Verona. Gaspare was probably in his 60s at that time, and he had an illustrious lifetime of studies behind him. He'd been in Florence during the 1430s, during the golden age of the intellectual renaissance, when he got to know and studied with many of the brightest lights in the intellectual firmament. Those of you who've watched at least a few of the, these videos know who they are, the big hitters of the renaissance, scholars, manuscript hunters, and teachers, the smartest guys on the planet, brainiacs who were recovering and restoring ancient knowledge, the knowledge of the Greeks and Romans especially, and translating it, for example, from Greek or Hebrew into Latin. They were the driving forces in what was nothing short of an intellectual revolution. Gaspare learned Greek in Florence and then went to Rome in the 1440s and set up a private school where he taught Greek and Latin to young students one of whom was a Spanish kid named Rodrigo Borja, later much better known as Rodrigo Borgia, and even better known as Pope Alexander VI, and as the father of Cesare and Lucrezia Borgia. Gaspare wrote a grammar book and eventually got a job teaching at La Sapienza. And it was here one day in 1467 that this skinny teenager from Bassiano turned up hoping to be taught. <music> Rome in 
Rome in 1467 was the perfect place for young Aldo. Not only were there teachers like Gaspare, but there were men in town such as a wealthy cardinal named Basilius Basarian, who was Greek, who was a brilliant scholar, an expert on Plato, and who owned the finest collection of Greek manuscripts anywhere in Western Europe, almost 500 of them, along with hundreds more in Latin. Basarian was a great advocate for learning. In 1467, he wrote, there is no more worthy or honorable possession, no more dignified and valuable treasure than a book. They live, they converse, and speak with us. They teach us, educate us, console us. Books bring the past to life and place it before our eyes. It's safe to say that Aldo would take a very similar view of the role and importance of books, and he would devote his life to them. Now, and this is crucial to the story, Basarian worried about how fragile manuscripts were and therefore how easily precious knowledge could be lost. He'd seen this in action, unfortunately, some 15 years earlier with the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks under Mehmed the Conqueror in 1453. Mehmed was a very educated man who valued knowledge and who didn't want Constantinople pillaged after the conquest. But nonetheless, lots of ancient manuscripts were lost in 1453. One report claimed that 120,000 were destroyed. That's certainly an exaggeration, but war is always bad for books, art, and knowledge in general. Cardinal Bessarion grieved these losses and called the sack of Constantinople the fall of Greece. He had therefore been trying ever since to put together all of the wisdom of the ancient world, especially that of Greece, before it could be lost, to somehow preserve it for the future. Then in 1469, in an incredibly generous gesture, Bessarion donated all of his manuscripts to the city of guess where? Venice. And some 20 years later, Aldo, as if magnetized, would follow these manuscripts to the city. Now, something else galvanized Aldo at this time. Rome was the perfect city for a bright and ambitious young man in 1467, someone who was interested in books, because by a wonderful coincidence, an exciting new invention had just arrived in the city an invention that in 1467 could be found nowhere else in Italy and in only a few places north of the Alps, an invention whose mysterious workings were until recently a well-guarded secret. And that is, of course, the printing press. It had been invented and perfected by Johannes Gutenberg in Germany in the mid 1450s, so a bit more than a decade earlier. But at some point in the early 1460s, two Germans crossed the Alps into Italy and made their way south to the Benedictine monastery of Subiaco, some 40 miles east of Rome, bringing with them the secret of printing technology. Their names were Konrad Schweinheim and Arnold Panards. They came from Mainz, Gutenberg's town. They were associates of Gutenberg and it's possible that one or both actually worked on the famous 42-line Gutenberg Bible. In any case, there were expert printers with the know-how to produce their own printed volumes. And very soon after their arrival, they set up their press in Subiaco and in 1463 began printing books. A year or so later, that is just a year or so before Aldo arrived in Rome in 1467, they moved from Subiaco to Rome. And two of their biggest fans were Gaspare da Verona and Cardinal Bessarion, as well as, I think we can safely guess, young Aldo. And young Aldo, in the fullness of time, would become the greatest of all the Italian printers. But first of all, after he completed his studies in Rome and then went on for further grad studies, as we might call them in Ferrara, Aldo worked as a teacher. 
By 1480, he was in Carpi in northern Italy, where he worked as the tutor to two young princes from the Pio family. One of them, Alberto, would later become a great scholar in his own right. But at this time, he was only five years old, and so Aldo was basically his kindergarten teacher. Aldo almost certainly got this job thanks to his friendship with someone he met at school in Ferrara, the boy's maternal uncle, a young chap named Giovanni Pico, the Prince of Mirandola, a man we've met before in these videos, the guy who could recite Dante's Divine Comedy by heart, all 14,233 lines of it, forwards and then backwards. Pico wanted to turn Mirandola into an intellectual center, and he seems to have invited Aldo to spend some time there in the 1480s. And so Aldo, besides teaching his young princes, moved in the upper echelons of intellectual society. He was friends not only with Pico, but also with people like Angelo Poliziano and Marsilio Ficino, the new generation of scholars and linguists who were fascinated by ancient manuscripts and by Greek literature and philosophy in particular. But then in about 1490, Aldo upped stakes in Carpi and moved to Venice. It's natural for us to assume that he went there because he wanted to work as a printer. That might well be the case, but we don't actually know for sure that's why he originally went there. He might simply have gone in the first place in order to find more students or to found a school because the little Pio brothers had finished their studies with him. Everyone thinks about Aldo as a printer rather than a teacher, but for him, the two things went together. He was a very dedicated teacher with big ideas about education. He wrote a letter to Caterina Pio, the boy's mother, describing the necessity of students learning Greek and studying ancient philosophy, the works of Plato and Aristotle, for example, and he also wrote very movingly to her about his dedication to her boys. In any case, Aldo, or Aldus as he was now calling himself, absolutely loved Venice. He found himself in what he called a place more like a whole world than a city. He found a vibrant cosmopolitan center that was an intellectual hub with Venetian scholars like the great Pietro Bembo, here we see him painted by Raphael, mixing with Greek emigres from the East. Venice had traditionally had very strong ties with the Byzantine Empire in the East, with Constantinople, and Venice therefore became a natural place of refuge for Greeks after 1453. There were also publishers and great libraries, including ones with Greek manuscripts, such as those of Cardinal Bessarion. However, I should point out that the Venetians did not make Bessarion's collection available to many scholars at this time, and there isn't actually any good evidence that Aldus had access to it, appealing as the thought is, at least to me. But no matter, there were plenty of other books and manuscripts for him in Venice. Here we see where Aldus first set up shop in Campo Sant'Agostin, marked today by a commemorative plaque. In Aldus's day, there was a bakery next door, which would have been handy for his morning baguette, but which must have caused a few anxieties because bakeries were the buildings, the businesses most likely to catch fire. Two things seem to have prompted Aldus to go into the printing business in the 1490s. In the first place, he seems to have wanted better textbooks. He wanted more accurate and more attractive books for his students and for students in general. And in 1493, he hired a Venetian printer to produce a copy of his own Latin grammar, a grammar he himself composed for the edification of his students. So there's a pedagogical aspect to his foray into publishing right here at the beginning. Secondly, and more immediately, he was worried about war. The war that broke out in 1494 when King Charles VIII of France invaded Italy in order to press his claim to the throne of Naples, thereby throwing all of Italy into terrible upheaval. 
This is the beginning of what one writer at the time called the Troubles of Italy, which were brought about by greedy French dynastic ambitions. And we can't appreciate what Aldous was trying to do without understanding this dreadful political context, what Aldous himself called the tumultuous and sad times in which the use of weapons is more common than that of books. The French invasion of 1494 was to Aldous what Constantinople and 1453 had been to Cardinal Bessarion, a terrible threat to intellectual culture and heritage. Aldous was quite naturally worried that warfare would destroy the libraries of Italy and that much precious knowledge would be lost. And of course, that had been happening for centuries, if not millennia. It was probably no coincidence then that Aldous's first printed book appeared in late February 1495, soon after the French invasion. It was a Greek grammar, a book by Constantine Lascaris. It's a dual language edition in both Latin and Greek. And it contains a kind of manifesto in which we can read Aldous's fears for classical learning at the hands of marauding soldiers because in the work he laments the huge wars that devastate all of Italy and soon seem to overwhelm the whole world from its very foundations. So he's dedicating himself, he writes, to the advantage of humanity. And he says that he's going to sacrifice a quiet and peaceful existence for one full of worries and hardships, which for the most part are going to be economic, because then, as now, sadly, you don't get rich through writing and publishing quality books on philosophy and other intellectual topics. And in fact, Aldous seems to have been so short of cash at various points that you didn't ever want to get an invitation to his dinner table, because he would serve you soup made from moldy cheese and snails that he collected from the public latrines. Aldous needed to find startup capital for his press, and he seems to have turned to his former student, Alberto Pio, who may have helped him out because Aldous dedicated his first book to him. But he entered into a financial partnership with two guys. One was a printer named Andrea Torresano, who had more than 20 years of expertise, so someone whose experience Aldous could draw on, and he's the one who published Aldous's Latin grammar. And the relations became even more intimate when Aldous married his daughter. The other was a wealthy Venetian aristocrat named Pier Francesco Barbarigo, whose father and uncle had both served as doges in Venice. In fact, his uncle, Agostino Barbarigo, was doge throughout the 1490s. And this shows that Aldous, even in these early days, was moving in pretty lofty circles. Aldous owned about 10% of the company, but he was the driving force behind it, the one who apparently made decisions about what to publish. And so it was presumably Aldous who in 1494 or 1495 came up with the ambitious plan of printing in Greek, the complete works of Aristotle. Aristotle was the uncontested authority on a whole range of subjects. But before Aldous, it was very difficult to read him in the original Greek. Aristotle's works could be read in good Latin translations, including printed ones, but manuscripts in Greek were much harder to come by, and no one had ever attempted to print all of Aristotle's works in the original Greek. But by June of 1498, after about three years of work, Aldous and his team, because he had about 14 employees at the press, as well as a group of scholars and experts who consulted with him, had produced five volumes of Aristotle's works, and they thereby made his work widely available to scholars in its original language. Just a quick word about the Greek type. Aldous was not the first to print in Greek letters. 
A printer in Milan had produced a Greek grammar in 1476, an edition of Constantine Lascaris, and an edition of Homer was printed in Florence in 1488, a magnificent accomplishment. It was obviously tricky to get the lettering right. The job was much more complicated than just doing the 24 uppercase and 24 lowercase letters of the Greek alphabet. You had to know which ligatures and diacritical marks such as accents could be included, as well as things such as breathing marks, the little squiggles that look like apostrophes that indicate the presence or absence of an H sound. As an indication of how complex it was, a later printer in Greek working in Italy found that he needed 776 different pieces of type. Aldous was accomplished in Greek, but of course he needed help. And Greek scholars who had fled Constantinople and the East were obviously vital to his enterprises. And Aldous based his type on the handwriting of a friend of his, a scholar from Crete named Marcus Mazuras, who was professor of Greek in Padua. The type for it was cut by the engraver Francesco Grifo, who designed both Greek and Latin characters for Aldous, including an elegant Roman type, later known as Bembo, because it was first used in a book that Aldo printed by the great scholar and poet Pietro Bembo. It's one of the most beautiful and influential typefaces ever made, the ancestor of fonts such as Garamond, for example. Grifo was a brilliant designer, one of the greatest who had ever lived, but he was also a difficult character. He fell out with Aldous, although Aldous could also be difficult, to be fair. And then even more seriously, he eventually fell out with his son-in-law, whom he beat to death with an iron bar in the house they shared in Bologna. Grifo's exact end is not known for certain, but he was presumably executed for the crime. A very sad end to someone who'd been such a wonderful engraver and goldsmith. One of the things that Aldous gave us was punctuation, the semicolon, the apostrophe, and the comma. The comma and semicolon were intended to help us as readers to let us know the rhythm of a sentence, when and how long to pause. I realize that the semicolon and apostrophe are both now on the endangered species list and the subject of much abuse but they do serve a purpose, setting off parts of grammar from other parts, making the meaning clear. And this is what Aldous wanted to do. He wanted to make the reading experience easier, to make reading less of a puzzle. Aldous went on to print lots of other works in Greek, including the complete works of Plato, which he finished in 1513. He was saving the intellectual treasures of ancient Greece for the modern world of the 1500s, and so too, ultimately, for us. Now, we won't go on about Plato here, but those of you who have watched my enthralling video on him will know just how important his recovery was to Western culture. He was recovered by the Florentines in the 1400s, given by them to the world in Latin, and now, in 1513, Aldous gave him to the world in Greek. This is the Ipnerotomachia Polyphily, published by Aldous in 1499. Still, more than 500 years after publication, one of the strangest, most mysterious, and most beautiful books ever produced. It's also one of the most valuable and that's a nice irony, because the book itself was a flop when it came out. Almost no one bought it. It's a mysterious book because no one actually knows who wrote it. A Dominican friar named Francesco Colonna seems the likeliest candidate, although it has to be said it's a very unlikely and counterintuitive project for a Dominican friar. And likewise, no one knows who did the remarkable illustrations, a total of 172 wood engravings, which are masterpieces of line and design. And it's a very strange book because it tells a very strange story. 
the title translates as the strife of love in the dream of Polyphilo. Polyphilo in a dream within a dream searches for his beloved, a nymph named Polia. And along the way, he goes through a kind of labyrinth of ancient architectural ruins, statues, Latin and Greek inscriptions, hieroglyphics, and all sorts of mythological and allegorical figures. The book is written in an invented language, a mishmash of Italian, Latin, and Greek, as if it were done by sort of 15th century James Joyce. One scholar has called it learned macaroni and claimed that only the most pugnacious of readers can force their way through it. That may well be so. It may be tough going to read, but it's a pleasure to turn the pages because it's an absolutely amazing virtuoso feat of typography and illustration. One of the hieroglyphics in the Ipnerotomachia gave Aldous the symbol for his press, the famous dolphin and anchor, which represents his motto, Festina Lente, make haste slowly. The dolphin represents haste, liveliness, and activity, and the anchor is stability. And these were the two qualities that Aldous wished to combine. Ferelda's next great innovation, I want to fast forward a few years to December the 10th, 1513. In what is probably the most famous letter of the 1500s, an embittered, out-of-work Florentine politician named Niccolo Machiavelli writes to a friend in Rome. Niccolo is living just outside of Florence, in exile and in disgrace recently sprung from prison and spared execution for plotting against the Medici. Here, living in the country, he describes his typical day to his friend. The letter is famous because in it, Niccolo describes how he's just finished writing a little book on principalities, what became, of course, The Prince, one of the most notorious books in history. But I want to look at another part of the letter. Niccolo describes how he gets up in the morning and goes into the woods where he watches his woodcutters chopping down trees. And then he writes, upon leaving the woods, I go to a spring. I have a book under my arm, Dante, Petrarch, or one of the minor poets. This might not strike us as being out of the ordinary. We can easily read books outside, on the beach, on buses, on airplanes, but Machiavelli is boasting here. This is the equivalent of flourishing the latest iPhone in the face of your friend. Because being able to walk around in the woods and then sit in the nook of a tree and pass the hours with a book that you carried with you was something entirely new. And it was something that was made possible by Aldous, who in about 1500 began creating what he called libelli portatiles, or portable books. Previously, most printed books were page monsters, big folios bound in leather and board that you would have had to wrestle out the door of your house. And that besides being heavy and awkward, made for the desk or the lectern, were expensive enough that you wouldn't want to cart them into the woods for a spot of reading, even if you could. The octavo format, as this small size was called, was used previously, but almost exclusively for devotional books, for prayer books and such like, so you could carry them around with you to perform your prayers and devotions. But Aldous, who wanted to spread knowledge and make it accessible and enjoyable, who wanted to take it out of the study and into the world, who wanted you to be able to carry that wisdom in your pocket, realized that it could make the reading experience different. You didn't have to sit at your desk inside your house or study. You could take a book with you to read, like Machiavelli, in a meadow, a tree, or on your travels. Now, in order to print these small books and make them affordable, I'll come to prices in a minute, Aldous invented something else, italic print. 
he based his italics on the handwriting, a cursive script used by Italian scribes in the 1400s. Why did he do this? Because oblique letters take up less space than regular upright ones, making it so he could print more words on each page and thereby keep his paper and printing costs down so he could sell his portable books for less. Incidentally, we now call this style italic, which is what the French printers began calling it when they made counterfeits of it for their bootleg editions of his work, because Aldous was bootlegged. But the Italian printers originally called it Aldino as a kind of tribute to Aldous. We can think of these little books as the equivalent of paperbacks, of Penguin Classics or something like that. And like the editors of the Penguin Classics, started just after World War II on the brink of mass education, Aldous was trying to make quality books accessible for larger groups of people. Now, as far as Aldous's prices went, a single volume of his Aristotle would cost you two to three ducats. Although as part of a deal, you could get the whole five volume set for 11 ducats. Now that's a fair whack. Aldous as a school teacher had probably earned less than 100 ducats a year, maybe as many as few as 50 or 60. And so 10 or 12 ducats for the complete Aristotle is a big outlay for a teacher or scholar. But it's still a lot cheaper than a single handwritten manuscript. A single manuscript by the greatest manuscript dealer of the 1400s, the great Vespasiano da Bistici, could set you back 50, 60, 70 ducats. So the printing press obviously makes information more widely available by bringing new social economic groups into the marketplace. In any case, Aldous wanted to exert a downward pressure on prices, and his pocketbooks were aimed at a much wider audience. And in fact, he did a print run for some of these of 3,000 copies, which for those days was an absolutely huge print run. And in fact, many authors today would give their incisors for a print run of 3,000 copies. Now to conclude, I wish I could say that Aldous got rich, but he didn't. However, he did get famous, so famous that every writer in Europe wanted to be published by him. The greatest scholar in Europe at the time, Desiderius Erasmus, wrote to him saying that the elegance of his volumes would make him, i.e. Erasmus, immortal if only they could work together, which they did, and they became friends, and Erasmus did become immortal. In 1514, the year before he died, Aldous wrote about how he was harassed by all the people coming into his print shop. I am hampered in my work, he wrote, by a thousand interruptions. Nearly every hour comes a letter from some scholar, and if I undertook to reply to them all, I should be obliged to devote day and night to scribbling. And he was lucky. These were the days before email. He eventually stuck a sign on his door that said, whoever you are, you were earnestly requested by Aldous to state your business briefly and to take your departure promptly. So we can thank Aldous for achieving his magnificent vision of a, a world in which books were elegant and of high quality, yet copious, inexpensive and available to all for trying to place the greatest wisdom of the ages in the hands of all of us so that we could, like him, work through our own tumultuous and sad times for the benefit of humanity. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe. Please watch more of these videos. And please remember the words of Cardinal Bessarion. There is no more worthy or honorable possession, no more dignified and valuable treasure than a book. And therefore, if you want to know more about Plato and printers in the 1400s and about the brainiacs recovering the exquisite knowledge of the ancients, I can't think of a better resource for you than my latest book, The Bookseller of Florence, available in your favorite bookshop.